Hello, everybody, and welcome to Tuesday Talk. I'm Liz Anders, the chair of Always United this year, and I, we're very happy to have you here today. We've got a very special program with Dr. Linda Bell. I know most of you have seen her on television before, and she's doing a personal thing for the Always United crowd today. So we're pleased to have her. We then will have a short follow-up information from our sponsor, AARP Driver Safety. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Claudia Brooks, our chair of activities, and she will introduce the speakers. Thank you, Liz. And I just want to let our audience know that if you have questions for Dr. Bell, please put them in the chat. Um, she'll be answering those at the end of her presentation. So now I'd like to really thank and bring on Dr. Linda Bell. Um, Dr. Bell was trained in internal medicine at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical. She has worked in public health for over 28 years, including as an epidemic intelligence service officer with the Centers for Disease Prevention and Control, and in several positions with DHEC. Dr. Bell is currently the South Carolina State Epidemiologist and Director of the DHEC Bureau of Communicable Disease Prevention and Control, providing oversight for the divisions of acute disease epidemiology, um, um, immunizations, tuberculosis control, STD, HIV, and viral hepatitis prevention and surveillance assessment and evaluation. Dr. Bell, we really appreciate you being here, our Always United members. Thank you for giving us your time today. Thank you so much for the invitation to join you. I hope it's, uh, I hope it's helpful. If you'd like me to go ahead and get started. If you would, I, we'd be happy to just give you all the time you need. Well, thank you so much, and I appreciate having received uh, some of the questions in advance. I hope that the presentation addresses a number of these, but I'm happy to um, address additional questions as time allows at the end. Uh, this will focus on the vaccine update, but if I can have the next slide, I just wanna give a little bit of background of where we are in South Carolina now with the current disease activity. And this slide shows our experience with COVID-19 since we first identified it in South Carolina in March of 2020. So we are almost a year in now. And this bar graph represents the blue bars over time, we call this an, uh, an, an epi curve or an epidemic curve, showing the number of confirmed cases over time. And what you can see to the right side of the slide is that we are coming down now from an incredibly high surge of cases from the beginning of 2021. One thing that I want you to pay attention to is the green line showing the seven day moving average of cases reported each week. And what you'll see is a dramatic decline from that peak around the 1st of January. But I want your eye to go back to the left of the curve back to around July of 2020 and remind everyone that the number of cases that we were experiencing at that time, we found to be extremely alarming. So that if you compare where we are now back to July 1st, it demonstrates that we still have a relatively high level of disease transmission in our communities, far higher than where we need to be before we can stop relaxing the recommended prevention measures. So the, uh, the message, excuse me, the message is, if I can go to the next slide, is that now is not the time to relax those prevention measures. Even though we're seeing that dramatic downward trend, we're coming from such a high point in the disease outbreak that we still must continue to wear masks consistently and correctly. That means covering your nose and your mouth whenever you're out in public, that the mask is well fitted and uh, constructed of at least two layers of fabric. I'll talk a little bit more about masking recommendations. We continue to recommend that you get tested based on your activities in the community at least once a month if you're out and about, or if you recognize that you have been in contact with someone who's positive, or you believe that you have a risky exposure, then you should get tested at that time to know your status. That information is what helps us um, advise people about when they should be in isolation so that they don't spread the disease. 
And it's very important because a very high proportion of people can spread the virus even though they have no symptoms. And then just be mindful of uh, gatherings when you're out in public to avoid uh, groups, to always practice physical distancing, and be mindful in particular of the risk of household transmission because your family members, your loved ones who may not know they're carrying the virus can introduce it into your home. And the home setting is where we're seeing the most commonly, um, the most common rate of transmission from person to person. Next slide, please. At the community level, this is just a reminder that um, throughout our state, I'll show this slide in a second, we have mask ordinances. And in our communities by jurisdiction, either at the county level or even the, the local level, when mask ordinances are in place, CDC has published data and our own DHEC data demonstrates that when there's a mask mandate in place, there's a significant decrease in community transmission of the virus. And in settings where they don't have a mask mandate, we've seen a 100% increase in new cases per 100,000 population. And this again drives home the point as to why we need to continue to practice the prevention measures while we look uh, for the increase in vaccine coverage in our population, which will not occur at a high enough level until late, much later in this year. The next slide please shows where in South Carolina, this is information from our emergency management division, showing that currently only eight counties have countywide mask ordinances. And the, um, the blue areas throughout the other counties represent local jurisdictions, about 58 of those that have mask ordinances. So um, we are widely unprotected from those rules at the county or jurisdictional level from exposure from the requirements for masks. So it's still important for us to pay attention to that. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, please, uh, next slide. And I'm going to move into discussion of the vaccines now with the next slide. First of all, I want to talk about how the currently available vaccines work. I get lots of questions about this because you're hearing that these are messenger RNA vaccines. Well, what does that mean? It means that there's a very small portion of the genetic material from the virus that is incorporated into a vaccine. The vaccines do not contain the virus itself. They do not have live virus, and so the vaccine cannot give you the disease. It cannot transfer the virus. This small part of the um, RNA from the virus is incorporated to a, into a vaccine that is administered through a shot, and, and it stimulates your body to recognize the protein that the RNA codes for, so that when you actually encounter the virus through natural exposure, your body's immune response recognizes it. It creates killer cells and it creates antibodies to attack the virus so that it kills it when it's in your system. The virus, um, excuse me, the vaccines are very effective in preventing severe disease and hospitalization. However, they cannot completely interrupt an individual from actually carrying the virus and transmitting, uh, excuse me, transmitting it to others. And I'll talk about that a bit more. If I can have the next slide, please. Another frequent question is whether or not one vaccine is better than the other. Currently, we have two that are available now, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, and we hope very soon to be approved by the uh, Food and Drug Administration is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. They have submitted their research materials to the Food and Drug Administration, and we may get approval for emergency use authorization for this vaccine as well later on in February. So first of all, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that are both those messenger, um, messenger RNA vaccines have been shown to be about 95% effective in preventing severe illness and hospitalizations. The safety profile of both of those vaccines is very similar. So really no unexpected side effects from other vaccines that are available. And I mean other vaccines other than COVID-19 vaccine. So there are really no implications for choosing between one or, uh, or the other of these particular products. And I, and I recommend against trying to shop around and finding either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. And additionally, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is also highly effective uh, in preventing severe disease, hospitalizations, and deaths. The point about these vaccines is that you still may be able to get infected, but you won't have severe disease. So you can carry the virus 
you are protected, but you may be able to actually spread the, vi the virus to other people. And this is why the prevention measures, the continued use of masking is recommended because we are preventing severe health consequences in those who are vaccinated, but we don't yet have enough data to show that we are protecting others who they come in contact with. So until we get very high coverage in the population as a whole, we must all continue to practice the physical distancing and the use of masks. So when I get the question, is one vaccine better than the other, or should I try and pick and choose? What I say is that the vaccine that's best is the vaccine that is immediately available for you. So as we open up more groups to be eligible to be vaccinated, please just make an appointment and get the vaccine that is readily available. Next slide, please. Um, and so next slide, please. Lots of questions about side effects, what to expect when they're vaccinated. And I think this is what raises some concerns about the uh, side effects of the vaccine. As with any um, injection in the arm, a shot that's given with the needle, we expect that you will experience maybe pain, some swelling or soreness at the site of the injection. Additionally, the body's immune response may cause some individuals, anywhere from about 30 to 50% of people to have other side effects that include something like um, headaches, muscle aches, joint aches, um, tiredness, headache, these represent your body's immune response to the vaccine itself. These are not adverse side effects. They may occur anytime from 24 to 48 hours after the initial injection. They are more common after the second shot, but they usually resolve within about 24 to 48 hours after they start, and they can be easily treated with um, Tylenol or ibuprofen. So they don't last long, and these are not uh, issues of concern. Next slide, please. The only indication for individuals who should not get vaccinated are any persons who have a history of a severe allergic reaction called anaphylaxis to a component in the vaccine. And this would be something like um, polyethylene glycol that might be contained in the vaccine. That's the most common uh, allergic stimulant. Severe allergic reactions can be treated with epinephrine, and this is why we recommend that individuals should be observed for 15 minutes uh, for all individuals. But if you have a history of a severe allergic reaction to another drug or to another vaccination, you should be observed for 30 minutes. And these severe allergic reactions can be treated. So there's a lot of words on this slide, but the main point that I want to make is that these immediate allergic reactions occur within about um, four hours, if they're gonna occur at all, after the vaccination. And if I can have the next slide, please. This shows the, com uh, the common ingredients in the mRNA vaccine. So they contain salts, they contain the mRNA, vac uh, the mRNA genetic material that I mentioned, other lipids that help introduce it into your bloodstream, it doesn't introduce the genetic material into your uh, DNA, and they contain another lipid that is the most probable cause of anaphylaxis. Next slide, please. So precautions for vaccination are that if you've had an immediate allergic reaction to any of those components, or an uh, intramuscular injection, or an IV, uh, if they give you drugs in your vein, or a, any other vaccine, that is not related to a component of the messenger RNA vaccine, then that's a precaution and they would want to observe you for 30 minutes. There's, that doesn't necessarily mean that you will have a severe allergic reaction to these vaccines, but it's just a, it's just a precaution. This is what we do to protect you and the safety of, and ensure the safety of the vaccines. Next slide, please. If individuals have a history of other allergies like food or pets, or a bee venom or something like that, environmental allergies, um, history of allergies to other oral med medications, latex, eggs, or gelatin, none of those are reasons not to be vaccinated. It's perfectly safe for you to receive a vaccine if you have a history of allergies to these other types of things. Next slide, please. So next slide. I wanna talk a little bit about the risks of the vaccine that I've just gone over. 
and the benefits of the vaccine. Because what I hear a lot is this, I put this in quotation marks, I'm going to wait. I don't think the vaccine is safe. I want to wait and see more people getting the vaccine before I can make a decision. And in fact, in the in the clinical trials, tens of thousands of people were given the vaccine. That's what gave us the evidence of their um, effectiveness and their safety. And following the clinical trials, currently over 44 million people have been vaccinated in the United States. And there's an ongoing surveillance system conducted by the CDC that's called VSAFE that continues to monitor potential adverse events following the shot. And if I can have the next slide, please. What we know is that those, uh, the occurrence of anaphylaxis that I had mentioned, that severe allergic reaction, occurs on the order of only about three to five events for every million doses administered of the COVID-19 vaccine. And to compare that to, uh, say, the flu vaccine, those severe allergic reactions occur on the order of about 1.4 per million doses administered. Or for the pneumonia, the pneumococcal vaccine, on the order of about 2.5 million events per doses administered. So the point is that the safety profile of the COVID-19 vaccines is very similar to what you see with other vaccines that have been widely available for years and years. The um, next slide, please. So when we, when we consider the potential risks of these rare events with allergic reactions, we wanna consider the risk of the actual disease itself. This is what I want more people to ask about. When they ask about the risk of the vaccine, what about the risk of the disease itself? I've already shown a slide that demonstrates that we still have high rates of disease transmission in our communities. So the risk of exposure remains high. And when this particular slide shows the reported deaths in South Carolina by age and race, and when you look at age groups, this might be a little bit blurry, but the tallest bar there represents the deaths in those who are between the ages of 75 and 79. So it is those individuals in that age group who have the highest death rate. And broadly, or more broadly, I should say, between the ages of 70 and 85 is where we're seeing the greatest risk of death. And this is why we're encouraging individuals over the age of 65 to be vaccinated because these vaccines have been shown to prevent severe hospitalizations, severe illness, hospitalizations, and deaths. The vaccine benefits outweigh the risk of the vaccines. And when we look at the risk of disease, if we can go to the next slide, please. Individuals who have certain underlying conditions are more likely to be hospitalized should they be infected with the virus that causes COVID-19. So conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, severe, more, uh, excuse me, severe obesity, all significantly increase the risk of hospitalization. And if you have uh, more than uh, two or more of these conditions, your risk of hospitalization could be as high as five times greater than other individuals without these. So again, the risk of the disease itself is far greater than any rare risk of severe allergic reaction to the vaccine. Next slide, please. So in short, the benefits are that mortality from COVID-19 in populations at increased risk for severe illness is quite substantial at this time. And treatment options for COVID-19 are actually limited. So until we achieve widespread vaccination, we need to continue to press on to seeking uh, the doses when they're available because this is our most effective way in uh, bringing us out of this pandemic and saving lives. I will reiterate that the CDC and the Food and Drug Administration continue to monitor for adverse events, including anaphylaxis, and uh, we'll continue to assess the benefits and risk of vaccination in the context of this evolving pandemic. Next slide, please. And the next slide. I'm gonna move through more quickly so that I can get to questions. This table represents where we are with the phases in uh, South Carolina for administration of the vaccine. Right now we're in what we call phase 1A. 
where we are targeting those healthcare workers who are at highest risk of exposure because they are providing care for people who are infected. Additionally, in phase 1A, our individuals in long-term care facilities or nursing homes because it is that group where we have seen the highest death rate. And additionally, they live in a congregate setting where if the virus is introduced into a setting like that, we see rapid transmission and uh, a high rate of infections in those settings, not just among residents, but among the staff as well. So protecting those populations is, um, is critically important in saving lives. And there are additional mission critical individuals in the society who uh, we prioritize to be protected to maintain critical services in, uh, in South Carolina. With the currently limited number of doses of vaccine, it will probably take us into April to complete the vaccination of those high-risk groups in phase 1A. But we are considering now how quickly we can transition to phase 1B, which includes other frontline essential workers who are at substantially increased risk of being exposed to the virus because of their jobs. And then in phase 1C, we will include all of those who are between the ages of 16 to 64 who have certain underlying medical conditions and all other essential workers who uh, provide services in the community like grocery store workers, transport workers, food services, agriculture, um, energy, and, uh, and many other essential services. This information is available on the DHEC website. If you want more details, there are links there. The problem is that the vaccine supply is very limited. The red numbers under each of the phases on this slide show the, the population in each of these groups. So there's approximately 1.2 million people we need to vaccinate in phase 1A before we can uh, begin to transition to phase 1B, unless guidance changes. We may find that we need to move more rapidly to these other phases to get more individuals protected but there are approximately half a million people to be protected in phase 1B, and then nearly 2.9 individuals in phase 1C. So this essentially covers the majority of the uh, South Carolina population. There are about 5.2 million people in the population. And so the challenge is that we are only receiving about 80,000 doses of vaccine each week. And that tells the story of how, um, what represents delays in getting all these people vaccinated as quickly as possible. This has recently been compounded by severe uh, weather problems that have uh, delayed the delivery of doses from the uh, central hubs in Kentucky and Tennessee that were severely impacted. So there are many things beyond our control in delivering the vaccine as quickly as we'd like to. With the next slide, please. I think these are my final few slides. I just want to share that we do have information available on the DHEC website that uh, helps individuals find a location where they can receive uh, the vaccine through an appointment. But for those individuals who uh, don't have internet access or who you know, struggle with a computer and they don't have someone that can help them with that, there is a vaccine information line. The number is 866-365-8110. Eight one one zero, and we can put that in the chat box. But they can call this helpline for assistance with getting an appointment where uh, doses are available to be administered. And with the next few slides, please, I'm going to just talk briefly about the uh, vaccine variants. Excuse me, the viral variants. Next slide, please. There's a lot of interest in the fact that the um, variants to the coronavirus have been identified in our communities. And what, how this occurs is that it's actually quite common for viruses to have mutations in their genetic material that sort of change anything from the surface of the virus or the uh, internal genetic material of the virus that has implications for how the virus may be transmitted. It can become more easily transmittable or less easily transmittable. It can cause more severe disease or less severe disease. And so what we know now is that RNA viruses do mutate frequently. And all of these mutations are not necessarily important in terms of how they impact the population. What we're currently seeing in South Carolina are a small number of isolates of the UK or the British variant. That's the B117 variant. 
and the South African variant, the B1351 variant. So you may hear different reports of this in the news. The issue with these two variants is that we do know that they are spread more readily. That means they're more infectious, but they do not necessarily cause more severe disease. However, if more people are infected, we will see more hospitalizations. And so this is why we need to uh, continue to protect ourselves with the masks, the physical distancing, because we need to stay ahead of that curve of disease transmission in the community. Those prevention measures are effective against all currently circulating strains. And in fact, the currently available vaccines and the vaccines that are coming down the pipeline are also effective against these new variants. What we do not know is whether or not the variants will continue to mutate and the vaccines may become less effective, uh, which could result in the, the possibility of us having to get vaccination each season like we currently do for the flu. So if I can have the next slide, please. This just outlines what we don't know about the new variants. New variants might not respond the same to uh, currently available medications. There are um, antibody treatments and antiviral treatments. One of them is remdesivir that's available in the hospital now. These variants may lose uh, their resistance uh, or may lose rather their susceptibility to these treatments. So that's something to monitor. We may see breakthrough infections of people who have previously actually had COVID-19 and they can be reinfected again with these variants. And then finally, the concern that uh, available diagnostic tests may not detect the new variants, but at this time they do. So we are still able to detect these variants, um, but we are only sampling a small number of, uh, of uh, human samples in the community at this time. So we actually believe that these variants are circulating at a higher level in the United States than is currently recognized. And this is something to really be um, vigilant about. And if I can have the next slide, I believe this may be, yes, that's my final slide. So at this time, I'm happy to address any questions that you have. I, I thank you for your attention. And Dr. Bell, we thank you. And you do have some questions. I'm gonna put them on the screen and read. And then we have some that people sent in um, earlier to us. So start with this one, um, Sarah. Fawcett is thanking you for making time for us today. Um, she is the CEO of United Way of the Midlands and we're glad she's here. Uh, can you please, please explain what herd immunity is and what it means for the pandemic spread? Yes, thank you for that question. That's a great, a great question. So if we look at ourselves as people, but what if we consider ourselves, we're really a herd of people. And so what we mean by herd immunity is when there's a sufficient number of people in the population who have received the vaccine and who have developed immunity. So that when we get to a level of about, um, we're, we're really shooting for about 70 to 80% of the population to be protected with the vaccine. And then when there are other people within that population, that 20% who are not yet protected, they are still protected because they're surrounded by people who do have immunity. So it significantly limits the ability of the virus to find susceptible people in a population. And when that occurs, disease transmission will fall and fall and fall. So when we get to herd immunity, that will be our way out of this pandemic because the disease will begin to burn out in the community, in a population. It can't find enough susceptible people to generate ongoing spread. And that's what we mean by herd immunity. Okay. Um, and then here's a question from Jeffrey Archie. Can you be at risk if you're administered the vaccine when you're possibly positive for COVID, but with no symptoms? Does it impact the effectiveness of the vaccine? Well, if you're already positive, you've lost the opportunity for the vaccine to protect you against that particular infection. But I did mention that there is the possibility of reinfections. So if you're, if you're positive and you uh, happen to turn positive between your first and second dose, if you're receiving a two dose series, then you can go ahead and complete the second dose at a later time. And the reason that's important is because immunity from natural disease may only last for a matter of a few months. But if you complete the vaccine series, 
you may have a longer duration of immunity that can last for months and months. And as we get a longer track record with the vaccine, we um, are looking forward to learning how long the vaccines actually offer protection. But what we do know is that immunity from the vaccine is better than immunity from natural disease. Okay. I'm, and I'm wondering if he also meant, what if you go to take the vaccine and you don't know you're positive? Would that, does that put you at a, diff, a different kind of risk with that, with both having it while you're getting a vaccine shot? Well, it certainly won't do you any harm and your, um, your body can still be stimulated to receive that second dose. So I'm sorry if I misunderstood the question. Um, I may have. Well, so whether or not it impacts the effectiveness of the uh, the vaccine-induced immunity could potentially interfere with your with your body's immunity, but that's not really known, and so it won't do any harm. And uh, and so they would, if they're unknowingly vaccinated and unknowingly infected, then uh, you know we just have more to learn about instances like that. Okay. Um, let's see. One, whoops, can't get it. Let me see if we can show that. Um, Natasha asked, I had COVID last year, but had a mild, mild symptoms. What are the chances that I can get this again? And can or will it be worse the next time? Yeah, so so individuals can get it again. We have uh, seen instances of reinfections. The majority of these happen more than 90 days after the first infection. But they're not very common. Uh, if you um, get it again on an individual level, uh, some people have had more severe symptoms the second time than they had the first, but that varies from one individual to the next and can't be predicted. Okay. Um, we had a question from uh, Ms. Olson. If people in any phase decline uh, vaccination, will we move on quicker to the next stage? Well, um, in a way, yes, because we are looking to achieve about 70% coverage in each of the phases. So when we reach about 70% of the people in phase 1A who want to be vaccinated, and uh, we would know that by uh, seeing a decline in the demand for vaccination. Now, I really don't see uh, the demand for vaccination declining in any way. We recognize that the demand far, far exceeds the current supply. But theoretically, if we saw a significant drop off in demand, then we would quickly move to the next phase. I just don't see that happening. OK. Um, and then this next question is from Lauren. How can I trust that the vaccine will work well with my current meds and won't cause any severe side effects? Um, there are currently no recommendations for avoiding vaccination based on any uh, medical treatment. So if you're, if you're taking your routine medications for underlying medical problems, there should be no interference between the currently available vaccines and those medications. Um, so I will give a caveat though. If someone has received a treatment using um, monoclonal antibodies, that some people do get therapies like that, either for COVID-19 or for other diseases, those, um, we, we call this a a passive administration of antibodies. In other words, your body doesn't actively develop them. You are passively administering these. You are passively administering these. If you receive a treatment like that, it could affect your body's response to the COVID-19 vaccine. So you should wait 90 days after having received a uh, monoclonal antibody treatment, uh, any kind of immune globulin therapy that, that could interfere with your body's immune response. Okay, and which brings up um, whoop, a another question about, I think she's asking about the antibodies here. Um, let me get that to come up for you. It's from Charmaine. Should people who had the virus and had have a test for the antibodies and donate their blood so it can be used to help in helping people who are very sick? Um, there is the potential for people who have been infected to donate their blood so that uh, it can potentially be used to administer those um, antibodies to other people. So if I'm making sure I understand the question here, if they've had the virus, so they don't necessarily be tested to determine that. They could go to a blood bank 
and just offer to make a donation and then the blood bank would make decisions. So instead of you having a separate test to look for the presence of antibodies, if you're willing to do that, that's encouraged to visit your blood bank. Okay. And um, I check one other place for some questions here. You've answered so many of the questions that have come in. We really appreciate um, the thorough job that you've done. We did have a question from Cynthia, and I think she had heard you on uh, a Sunday afternoon radio show talking about how the vaccine didn't start from scratch. And she was, um, as, as she put it, and she was wondering if you could maybe explain how they got to this vaccine so quickly. Of course. Um, I think what I was speaking to was the was that very question. How um, do we get to this point so quickly when vaccines research and development usually takes years? And part of it is that uh, we benefited from an earlier SARS outbreak that occurred um, approximately, it's been about probably 16 years ago now the first SARS epidemic. Well, they began vaccine development at that time, but because um, the pandemic was not as widespread, did not impact nearly as many countries, and in fact, there were only six confirmed cases in the United States, that was a reason that they stopped vaccine development because there was no longer the need for the vaccine. But that early research, we did benefit from developing uh, an early uh, prototype for a vaccine that was effective against a coronavirus that has a very similar genetic pattern with the currently circulating strain. So that was one thing. The other thing that in uh, vaccine research and development, they usually will go all the way through the clinical trials to look for safety and effectiveness before they will begin actually manufacturing the vaccine. But this time, because of the um, worldwide public health threat, the government made an agreement with the vaccine developers that they would pay them to go ahead and begin vaccine production while the clinical trials were being conducted. So those things are usually done in sequence. This time they were done simultaneously. So we saved months and months of waiting for the end of clinical trials to begin the vaccine development. It was already ready to go when we had the uh, data showing that they were safe and effective. And then. This question comes along with it from Sarah. Um, is it is the um, vaccine going to be like the flu vaccine, where you have to get a new vaccine every year? And we don't Do you know yet. <laughs> yeah, we don't know yet because of a couple of things. We don't have a long enough track record to see how long immunity lasts with the current vaccines, and we also don't know if the um, vaccine will con excuse me the virus will continue to circulate at a high level and continue to mutate so that the currently available vaccines are no longer effective against new strains that may pop up in the future. The current variants, we do have uh, data showing that available vaccines are effective against them, but we don't know what the future holds and we don't know if we will see um, seasonal COVID-19 vaccines like we have for seasonal flu vaccine. Okay. Um, we also had a question that came into us earlier from Leslie and wondered if you could discuss how equi equitable vaccine access could be provided to in more rural areas like the lower Richland area where residents may have transportation barriers presenting them, preventing them from accessing current vaccine sites. Of course, and we are doing a lot to address that. Um, uh, uh, for example, we have mapped out where we have active providers so that we can geographically look for gaps. And when we find limited access to the vaccine, we strategically provide vaccines to community health centers, rural health providers, chain pharmacies, and independent pharmacies in those areas to improve access. We are also working on mobile services, pop-up vaccination sites in rural areas. We are partnering with uh, community organizations like faith-based organizations, churches and whatnot, who uh, will serve as vaccination sites. We're looking at mass vaccination sites, but we, are, we continually actively monitor access in rural areas. And for those who have transportation issues, we are looking at ways to, when I say mobile services, we're actually looking at pop-up events that people would have to travel to. 
but we're also looking at the possibility of bringing actually bringing mobile services closer to communities for um, individuals who have uh, challenges with transportation. Okay. And uh, have a have a question here about the numbers of, of people. The number of people shown on each of the four groups would all need to receive two doses. So the 80,000 doses a week in South Carolina receives treats 40,000 people a week, correct? Assuming this um, timeline seemed optimistic, or is that or is um, Brad's math wrong? Well, actually, and that's a great question because it's 80,000 first doses. So we uh -huh. are the, we're able to administer 80,000 first doses. It's not uh -huh. cutting that in half. So that's one benefit. And then uh, what I forgot to mention about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is that when that comes available, that's a single dose vaccine. So they won't need to get two doses. So when we have more products available, um, that single dose vaccine may be a great option for people who uh, have challenges, as we mentioned, transportation challenges, difficulty getting off work to complete that second dose. So um, so it, it's good to look at the math like that to, to understand you know, what we're confronted with to reach our goals. Okay. Well, um, we really thank you for all of you you've talked to us about today. And I had a question because you talked about this early on and I've got two kinds of masks here. And one of the things that we've been hearing in, in some of the news is, do I wear one or do I wear two? <laughs> That's a great visual. Maybe I'll do my own visual because okay. the he came out with recommendations that has caused, I think, uh, we'll raise a lot of questions. Should people wear two masks? Now, one of the masks that you showed, not not mm -hmm. the one, the other one, um, okay. the other one that you showed. So that's available in grocery stores. It's got a little uh, metal bridge you can pinch it over your nose. Mm -hmm. So when you do that, it can create gaps around the sides. Do you see the gaps around her nose and mouth? So if you mask like that, and it doesn't necessarily fit your face well, you yep. may want to wear a mask on top of that that is well fitted. So my mask doesn't have gaps. It actually oh. fits my face. So, and it's also constructed of two layers of fabric. And there are some masks that have a pocket in them that you can insert a filter. So if you have a single mask that's well constructed of two or three layers, then you may not necessarily need to wear a second mask. Um, now, the other mask that you showed is either an N95 or a KN95 mask. It's a KN95. It's a KN95 mask. Those are usually used in healthcare settings. And those are most effective if, if an individual has been fit tested to wear that mask. Now, the general population does not get fit tested when they wear those KN95 masks. So that may not offer you any additional protection above that surgical mask. Mm -hmm. um, you can loop the mask around your ears to get it to fit more closely around your face. Sorry, the other one. Well, actually, okay. I have one of those. Okay. I have one of those. And if you wear glasses, as Claudia does, and you and your uh, breath is fogging up your glasses, that tells you that there are gaps in the mask and it's not real. Ah. So you got to put them. Someone, them someone gave me this and I just tried it. So that's what I mean about wearing a mask uh, consistently and correctly if it's fogging up. Mm -hmm. This is it's leaking. And uh, and so just keep making those adjustments. So I hope that's a good lesson on how to wear the mask. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Me. <laughs> Thank you. And um, Dr. Bell, we really appreciate you being here. And and as a last question, wonders is there anything and you've covered so much and really answered through all the questions that came into us early, answered almost everything that I saw. So is there one last thing you'd like to leave us with as um, as your advice to how we make sure that we get through this um, pandemic and and just be careful? Yeah, and, and so one thing would be the masks. They, as, as we look you know, towards the promise of the vaccines, I don't want anybody to forget how effective the measures that are currently available for everyone they are quite effective in preventing disease transmission. The mask, the physical distancing, limiting gathering will be very helpful to us in bringing that disease uh, trend in a continued downward uh, phase. So we, we must, even though we're all tired of this, we must continue those prevention measures. I really hope I've addressed concerns about the vaccine because um, any vaccine hesitancy concerns me. For, for people for whom the vaccine is available and they don't want it, 
I just want people to be mindful of weighing the um, the ongoing risk of the disease threat that outweighs the risk of the vaccine. So I, I do hope that I addressed any vaccine hesitancy. And, uh, and the final thing that uh, the, the gentleman brought to our attention is that nationwide, this is a very slow rollout because of the limited number of vaccine doses. So it's gonna take us weeks and weeks and weeks to get through this. We want people to have reasonable expectations of how long it's gonna take us to reach that herd immunity. So that in the meantime, I just encourage everyone to take control over what they do have control over and practice those prevention measures to protect themselves and their loved ones. So I'll end with that and, and also to, um, to really thank you for these educational opportunities mean a lot in our communities. And so um, United Always is providing a tremendous service and I appreciate that. Well, and we thank you. And I will join Sarah Fawcett in saying that you have been such a trooper through all of this, Dr. Bell. Thank you for serving the people of this state and being on the front line of the battle. We really appreciate you and thank you for your time today because I know you that you're headed to another event like this with the CDC. So <laughs> thank you for taking this time today. I think we're getting you off just two minutes late. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being here. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye. And we appreciate all of you being here. And one of the questions that came up was about transportation. And we are fortunate to have um, Melanie Dalton and Shelly Maddox with us with um, the Drive at 50 Plus program. They've talked to us about that before. So um, with an update on the AARP Ride at 50 Plus program in Richland and Lexington counties, and this program being powered by our the nonprofit organization Phoenix Mobility Rising, I am so happy to turn this over to talk to Melanie and Shelly. Because um, as you heard, some some of the questions are about transportation and getting to the sites and all. So we can give you a few minutes to update us on the, some good things happening. Thank you, Claudia. Hi, I am Melanie, and it's delightful to speak with you today. And how do you follow Dr. Bell? How do we possibly <laughs> come in with a great second on that one? But I did want to, to just acknowledge that, that Dr. Bell mentioned uh, that transportation is a social determinant of health. And without transportation, we are experiencing right now um, difficulties. Our, our, our community members are receiving or, or cha are challenged with getting to vaccine sites. And uh, that will continue long after vaccines are completed and we're back to good health again. So the AARP Ride at 50 Plus program is a one-stop shop for sourcing transportation providers, which will be enhancing access to transportation options in Richland and Lexington counties with a focus on our underserved populations. The program is convenient, it's economical, easy to use, safe and secure, and will take you to where you need to go. But I wanted to just share with you that right now during COVID-19, we are only available for limited essential rides, which are trips that are um, to and from medical appointments, pharmacies, and grocery stores and food related services. So let me share more with you about the program, uh, you know, as it operates in its full capacity. So the focus is to provide older adults with mobility uh, for a lifetime, although the program is available to anyone in need, regardless of their age or AARP membership, which is not required. Training on the use of the booking platform is available either online or by attending one of our virtual presentations. And I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. Now, currently the program is available in Richland and Lexington counties in South Carolina. And in case you have family or friends elsewhere in the country, we also are operating in Dallas County, Texas and Washtenaw County, Michigan. But here in South Carolina, as I said, Richland and Lexington. Now, there are several transportation providers available through the program. We'll start on the left-hand side of the slide with the public system. And the Comet is the public transit system here in our community with DART paratransit program covering multiple fixed routes throughout our region, both that may be accessed using the Ride at 50 Plus program. We also typically in healthier times provide access to Lyft and Uber rideshare uh, providers they're currently suspended from our program because of the health and safety reasons, but it is intended they, they will rejoin us uh, into the future. 
We have specialty transportation providers that provide door-to-door -door service, often offering a little extra TLC. We offer wheelchair service and ADA accommodations. And we also have an EMT provider that provides stretcher and emergency. Our two taxi services provide door-to-door -door and curb-to-curb on-demand service. And our Phoenix Volunteer Force and our Senior Rides Volunteer Driver programs offer cost-efficient solutions needed by some of our riders. Shelly is going to tell you a little bit more about our Senior Rides Volunteer Driver opportunity in just a second. Now, there are three different ways that you can learn about the program and request rides. First, you can call our customer, our toll-free customer support line. The number is up on the slide for you, but let me read it out in case you've got a pencil handy. You call one 888-851-2131. You can speak directly with one of our customer service agents who will walk you through booking a ride. You can also visit our website to learn again about the program and to book. And you reach that using the, uh, the access point that is right there in the middle of the slide. And it is aarp.org forward slash ride Columbia. And also, for those of you who are just a bit more technically savvy, you can download the Phoenix app in either of the two, um, uh, uh, either either the, uh, oh, forgive me, I'm lo totally losing my words right now, but in either the iOS or Android app stores. Once you've got the app, then you can access uh, booking uh, using either of them. Individuals and organizations may benefit from using the Ride of 50 Plus program. Organizations such as community centers, hospitals and clinics, senior residences, faith-based organizations, shelters, and social service agencies may set up booking accounts, which will facilitate booking rides for their members, their residents, or their guests. And riders and caregivers may, may set up individual customer accounts by going online or calling directly to our call center. Now, although the program and booking platform are both really simple, we do offer training options. You can again visit um, our online uh, access where you can watch a 20 minute video, which gives you a demonstration of the three booking options. You can, it'll show you how to use our call center, the web and the app. And if you would really like a little bit more in depth or detailed training and you'd like to be able to ask questions, then let us know will ensure that you are included in one of our upcoming events. You are more than welcome to drop your contact information into the chat. We'll retrieve it and do our best to reach out to you and schedule you in one of our upcoming training sessions. Uh, and that further information on how to do that will also be on the screen in just a moment. Now, we, um, we are able to move forward and grow within the community through our leadership and community awareness uh, quarterly meetings known as our Mobility Leadership Circle. And this is community members who come together and join us on a quarterly basis, listening to what we're accomplishing and offering uh, their collaboration with us and ideas and their contacts and all the information that they know about the community. We also offer our monthly advisory council meetings. So if you or anyone that you know within the community uh, is interested in influencing the future of transportation here in Richland and Lexington, or even in the greater United States, please let us know. We'd be happy for you to join us. Of course, we're doing that virtually at the moment, but the United Way of the Midlands hosted us on a monthly basis for these meetings, and we certainly look forward to going back to that when all is well and we can do that again. Now, in normal times, whether you're going to get your groceries, going out for dinner with friends, going to the doctor or anything else, the Ride a 50 Plus program has been created to provide you or someone that you care for with the transportation options that you need. However, I'll repeat this, currently and until further notice, due to COVID-19, we are currently only available for limited essential rides. And that is defined as trips to and from medical appointments, pharmacies, grocery stores, and other food-related services. To wrap up my part of the presentation, I wanted to share with you that the next steps in the, uh, the life of the AARP Ride of 50 Plus program are very exciting because we have received two grants funding rides for people in South Carolina. Starting in May, medical transportation will be made available 
through an FTA grant that we're calling Access to Care, which will provide rides for seniors age 65 plus, veterans and single parent households. So by coordinating the public system, private and volunteer transportation, our mobility as a service program and platform will expand access to care in Richland and Lexington counties. And within the next few months, we will also launch an elder care trust fund grant, which will provide funds for transportation to support seniors who are aging in place. I know I will have more to, uh, to, to share with you about that coming soon. If either of these opportunities have caught your interest, or you know people who may be able to benefit from either of these, again, please contact me or my colleague Shelley by dropping your information into the chat or by emailing us directly using the information that is on the next slide. We have long email addresses, but they're not difficult. So all you have to do is add our first names, and that's either Melanie or Shelley, before then typing in phoenixmobilityrising.org, and you'll be able to reach us. To wrap up our presentation, uh, Shelley will now tell you a little bit more about an opportunity that you can take advantage of to give back right here in your own community, and that is by joining us in our volunteer driver program known as Senior Rides. I thank you for listening to my portion. Please contact us with your questions for more information to learn more about how you can influence change in our community. And now, Shelley, go ahead. Tell us more about Senior Rides. Thanks, Melanie. Um, change the world one life and one mile at a time. This is the mission of Senior Rides of South Carolina, which is part of the Phoenix Volunteer Force. Phoenix Mobility Rising supplies innovation and infrastructure to power a volunteer-led transportation network here in the Midlands. Through Senior Rides of South Carolina, we pair dedicated volunteers with people in need of transportation, allowing them access to medical care, pharmacy, groceries, and more. After our relaunch of the AARP Ride at 50 Plus program in late 2020, with new COVID safety procedures for both drivers and passengers, we are more aware than ever of the need for this valuable opportunity to serve our neighbors in the Midlands. If you enjoy helping others, like being part of a team, would appreciate mileage reimbursement and gifts of appreciation, please visit volunteerdriver.org to join us. On the next slide, you will see my contact information along with the contact info for our volunteer coordinator, Heather Guyton. If you have a friend you'd like to refer, or if you have questions and aren't quite ready to commit, please reach out to one of us and we'll be happy to share more information with you about this unique service opportunity. Thank you, everyone. And I want to thank you too for bringing us all that good information. Um, and, and I'm sure if, you, if folks want to get some more information from you, would you share that with Adina? so that she can share it and um, we'll give you in just a minute information about how to contact um, uh, Melanie and, and Shelley. So if you would put that in the chat or Adina's going to come on in a minute and um, give us some of the additional information. We thank you very much for being here and so glad that um, you're available to help and this wonderful service is available to help people get to um, doctors and hospitals and pick up medicines and, and and vaccine sites. So thank you very much. And thank you for coming on and talking about that with us today. So I want to, um, it looks like, there we go. Adina, are you uh, going to join us? Hello. Hello. Um, I think Liz had to leave and mm -hmm. I know that we, she was very um, pleased with the presentation today from um, both of our, our speaker groups. Yeah. And we, uh, we actually do have some good news to talk about. Uh, our March 23rd Tuesday talk will be um, at noon. Um, Patrice, Patricia Pastides will be joining Ooh. us to talk uh, about cooking and cooking healthy. Um, she's even going to share with us um, some tips on growing great vegetables that we can use and, and that's something that I'm really interested in learning about. So if you'll mark your calendars for that. And I know, Adina, you have some information about Always United you'd like to share. 
Yes, yes. And so um, Always United is our late career and retiree um, focused um, group of individuals who have been involved with United Way of the Midlands or um, are just involved in the community and want to continue to be a part of it and um, and give back in any way they can. Um, it, the great thing about it is it is not limited to that age group and there's also no donation requirement um, to be a part of it. So um, if you are interested, um, you can just email alwaysunited at ua.org and you'll get a response from me. Um, and you can also learn more about it on alwaysunited.org. Um, and so um, with that, um, I would just like to say um, thank you um, everybody for coming. Um, thank you AARP um, Driver Safety for um, allowing us to be able to um, host um, events like this. And um, I hope everybody has a great day and um, I hope to see you at our next Tuesday talk. Your next Tuesday talk and let your friends know that this is uh, available in a recorded version on both Facebook and YouTube through the United Way of the Midlands sites. Thank you yeah. and have a good day. Okay, bye.